What is up you guys? Welcome back to Tea and Lit. In today's video we're doing something a little bit different because truth be told I'm not feeling my best today. Um, we're talking about William Shakespeare's Taming of the Shrew. That is our December 2020 read and let me tell you something. I am so glad that I've read this book at this point. If you guys have been following along on this channel then you know we've been reading one Shakespeare play a month and we started off high with Othello. It's my favorite one and then we sort of been taking a consistent trickle down from there and last month I read Pericles did not enjoy it in the slightest but the taming of the shrew has brought things back full circle this has been a, a wonderful way to end off our Shakespeare year with the great play that was the taming of the shrew so let's get into the review let's get into the synopsis not the review the review is at the end Lexi don't be silly so The Taming of the Shrew tells the story of this father who has two daughters and the younger daughter is fair and sweet and tender-hearted and she's got many suitors while the older daughter is a little bit wild and boisterous and has an opinion, you know, one of those crazy women and she's got no suitors. So the father says that he will not marry his younger daughter to any of her many suitors until her first daughter, until his first daughter Catherine is married off. Well, a few of the suitors come up with a, they hatch a plan to get Catherine married off so that they can be with Bianca, so that one of them can get with Bianca. And the partner in question for Catherine is just wild. In a word, wild. Um, she's great. One of the things that I'm loving most, excuse me, <coughs> so sorry, the thing that I love most about this character for Catherine is that we kind of associate Elizabethan England with very often, not so much Elizabeth herself, but these very like tepid women. We always think when we think of the olden days that women are just these weak little creatures that sit in a corner quietly and do what they're told and they let men dictate their whole lives and Catherine is a woman of tremendous ferocity um, and she's something particularly in the beginning of the story that is something to be idealized really in in some way to be a woman who kind of knows her opinions on things and then Throughout the story, it's fascinating to see how Shakespeare develops this character um, and to see how these sorts of things can happen if, in real life. These sort of relationships can develop in real life, um, particularly if we're not careful and mindful. Um, and we see that with both, both sisters, but particularly with Catherine. Um, and to see also that there's, you know, there's more to somebody than we sometimes think. So, anywho, that was Catherine. I think she's a great character and I definitely, particularly in the beginning, found myself being like, mm, that kind of feels like me. I found her to be very relatable. Um, her partner is Petruchio and he is a pragmatist and can we say abusive? <laughs> Can we say that? I feel like I want to say that. Um, but it was the way Shakespeare writes this is just glorious. The way he writes Petruchio as a character, his introduction and how he doesn't really care about anything uh, except for making sure that there's like a, a nice dowry associated with his bride. And then at the end to see how their dynamic kind of unfolds is really interesting. Um, this is definitely Catherine's story and she changes as a person, but in a way that's very severe. Um, and she has to endure some, some madness from Petruchio to get there. So um, I don't think he's anything to be idealized, but I do think that Catherine as a character was written in a way that's kind of not the way we expect old women, not old women, women to be written in olden times, if that makes sense. 
Um, and then that's juxtaposed against her sister, Bianca, and her partner, Lucentio, who isn't pragmatic at all and is kind of this grand romantic poet and wants these like grand gestures of, of romanticism and how that doesn't really um, bode well long term. And so much of this story reminds me of a quote that I can't remember from A Song of Ice and Fire where Catelyn says something like, love is built stone by stone. It's not like stolen away moments in the woods. It's like these daily grind moments. I should mention this is a comedy and we know that because people don't end up bloody in the streets really. Uh, the story starts out hilarious, absolutely hilarious, um, with one of the Shakespearean kind of like side stories. And the thing I loved most about it was that it really felt like the characters were talking to the audience, telling the audience how to behave, how to feel, what to think, and how to broach the story. It's like he set the stage from the stage, which I thought was amazing. This feels and reads like one that has to be seen live. I just want to see this live so bad because it reads like it would just be phenomenal. The thing I loved, I think it's scene, th I'm sorry, act three, scene one, there's quite possibly the best dialogue I've read all year um, between Catherine and Petruchio. And it's just hilarious. Let me see if I can find it. Um, maybe it wasn't act three. Nope, it was act two, scene one. By the way, this is not like the longest read ever either. Um, Catherine and Petruchio are talking for the first time and they are just going at it. <clears throat> so Petruchio develops this plan that he's going to just say how great Catherine is regardless of what happens. And we see here in line 193, it starts, you lie in faith for you are called plain Kate and Bonnie Kate and sometimes Kate the cursed but Kate, the prettiest Kate in Christendom, Kate of Kate Hall, my super dainty Kate, for dainties are all Kates, and therefore Kate, take this of me, Kate of my consolation, hearing thy mildness praised in every town, thy virtue spoke of and thy beauty sounded, yet not so deeply as to thee belongs, myself am moved to woo thee for my wife. Okay, so he's just trying to flatter her which is hilarious because people call her Catherine because she, they call her Catherine the curse because she's such a beasty lady. So Catherine responds, moved in good time. Let him that moved you hither remove you hence. I know you at the first, you were unmovable. Petruchio responds, why what's unmovable? Catherine, a joint stool. Petruchio, Thou hast hit it. Come, sit on me. Catherine, asses are made to bear, and so are you. Petruchio, women are made to bear, and so are you. Which brings me to a point. If you have sensitivities to sexism, this is not your read. Catherine, no such jade as you. If me, you mean. Petruchio, alas, good Kate, I will not burden thee. For knowing thee to be but young and light, Catherine, too light for such a swine as you to catch, and yet as heavy as my weight should be, Petruchio, should be, should buzz, Catherine, well tame, I like a buzzard, Petruchio, oh slow winged turtle, shall a buzzard take thee, Catherine, I for a turtle as he takes a buzzard. Petruchio, come, come, you wasp. I faith, you are too angry. Catherine, if I be waspish, best beware my sting. Petruchio, my remedy is then to pluck it out. Catherine, I, if the fool could find it where it lies. Petruchio, who knows not where a wasp does wear his sting? In his tail. Catherine, in his tongue. Petruchio, whose tongue? Catherine, yours, if you talk of tales, and so farewell. Petruchio, what with my tongue in your tail? Nay, come again, good Kate. I am a gentleman. I'm 
I was just dying laughing, and I cannot wait to see it on stage performed one day. Um, as I said, this is definitely not a book if you have sensitivities to sexism. Um, there were several, I mean, the whole point of the story is kind of the patriarchy, where the dad marries off the daughters to the suitors based on their dowries, not based on affections. So it's, if you've got any sensitivities, there was a line in there where it was like, um, go back to your needle point and stop complaining or something like that. So if that's something that bothers you, be sensitive to that. Um, now let's talk about the review. Quality of writing, obviously at Shakespeare, I'm giving it a five. Ease of reading, this was not his hardest read, so I'm also going to go ahead and give that, we'll say a four. Um, one of the things I said in a recent video is that the more you read Shakespeare, the easier Shakespeare gets. I stand by that. Um, and obviously we're kind of in the mood of Shakespeare here at Tea and Lit because we've been reading Shakespeare for the past four months. Um, after quality of writing, we do characters. I'm going to go ahead and give them a five. I feel like they were all pretty, the relevant ones were all pretty thought out. Um, and they definitely developed. Plot. Phenomenal plot, I think, to watch that growth happen. Um, and to communicate a love story that's very different than Romeo and Juliet, which is the one we associate with, like, the love stories. Um, I'm going to get a five. Cover design. I have the Folger Shakespeare Library cover. This one's golden and yellow. Quite lovely. I will go ahead and give that a four. Because, again, it looks lovely on my bookshelf. What pieces are we forgetting? Mm, I should go get my notebook. That's what a sensible person would do. As you can see, we're phoning this in today. I'm going to give this story a five. I loved this book. I loved this read. I want to see this play in person. It was just too funny. Um, and I would certainly recommend that you read this. This is a good one to start with. And I mentioned that in a previous video also cannot recommend The Taming of the Shrew more. It's super funny and kind of silly. And the thing is, sometimes the comedies don't read silly, they watch silly. This read silly. So that is that. I'm so sorry that I'm just a mess this week. I'm so sorry, but I do care for you guys and we'll, we'll do better. <laughs> Have a good one.